Hello, everyone. I am Becky Mossbrucker, and I am the owner of Forward Safety Training. I am here today because it is Stocking Awareness Month and also Human Trafficking Awareness Month. This is January 2024. So I'm going to share with you a presentation that I've watched several times um, that's going to talk about stocking awareness in particular. Human trafficking will be a different uh, video, uh, but I wanted to give you at least some information about what stocking looks like, um, how you can report it, um, what kinds of things you can do about it. Uh, I am not an attorney and I am not a police officer, so I cannot give you any kind of legal advice, what I can give you is my own personal experience and experience from clients that have hired me to help them learn ways to protect themselves. So with that being said, I'm going to share this presentation and I will be stopping in between slides and things to talk a little bit along the way. So you'll um, see me pausing every now and then. So we're going to get this started. So hold on just a minute. Let me get my screen share going here. All right, so this presentation is being uh, put on from the Stocking Prevention Awareness and Resource Center. It is a national organization, um, and I am just um, sharing this presentation with you. This is not one that I wrote, although I am going to write my own. Um, this one is not mine. So it will get into detail about stalking and interpersonal violence. If you get to a point where it is too much for you, I would pause it or skip forward to some of the other topics. And if it's just um, overwhelming for you, um, but you still want help, get out of the presentation, contact me. Um, you can find me on all social media platforms. You can also email me at forwardsafetytraining at gmail.com, and I will um, help you as much as I possibly can. So we're going to watch a three-minute introductory video, and then we'll move on from there. So why take the time to learn about stalking? Well, stalking is a really important thing to understand. It is criminal, it is traumatic, and it is dangerous. Stalking is criminal. It is a crime across the United States. That means it's a crime at the federal level, in all 50 states, US territories, tribal lands, and in our military justice system. It might be a misdemeanor or a felony, depending on the jurisdiction and the situation. A lot of people don't realize that stalking is a crime. And so many victims are left wondering, well, what, should I call the police because somebody rang my doorbell or drove by my house? And the answer is that victims can consider reporting to authorities as well as documenting the stalking. Stalking is traumatic. Many stalking victims experience mental health impacts, including depression, anxiety, insomnia, and social dysfunction. Quite a few also lose time from work. Many lose their jobs altogether. And a significant number of stalking victims choose to relocate. In fact, one in seven stalking victims move as a result of their victimization. It's important to hear from stalking victims and survivors in their own words. This survivor said, I have given up all hopes of ever having a safe life. The rest of my life, I will be looking over my shoulder, expecting to see him there. And finally, stalking is dangerous. Stalking often co-occurs with physical violence, including physical assault, sexual violence, and rape. One in five stalkers use weapons to threaten or harm their victims. And in 76% of intimate partner femicides, that's murder of a female partner by a male partner, in 76% of completed and 85% of attempted, there was stalking the year prior to that murder or attempted murder. And yet so often these early signs of danger are ignored as, oh, it's just texting, it's just ringing the doorbell. In fact, one researcher went so far as to say the stalking is homicide in slow motion. So what's the good news? The good news is that we have an opportunity. Because stalking is one of the few crimes where early intervention can prevent trauma, violence, and even death. When we recognize those early signs, take them seriously, connect victims to resources, and hold offenders accountable, 
we can keep our communities safe from this prevalent and terrible crime. That's why it's so critical that you learn about stalking and how to know it, name it, and stop it. All right, so the first part of this is um, know it. So we're going to do a couple of scenarios right here. Um, one of them is going to be about coffee. So with coffee, um, you receive a phone call. A woman is crying and gasping, struggling to speak on the other end. When she finally calms down, she says, there's a cup of coffee in my car. So what is your initial reaction? Do you feel alarmed, confused, annoyed? Does this caller seem rational to you? Does this call seem urgent to you? Do you think the police would find this call urgent? What possible situation might be occurring that would cause this level of panic about a cup of coffee? So eventually, this victim says, she's here. It turns out that the caller is a stalking victim who recently relocated. She did not believe that her stalker, who was her ex-girlfriend, who has threatened her repeatedly and physically in the past, knew where she was. When she left for work that morning, there was a cup of coffee sitting in her car with the pet name that her ex used to use for her. So does this new information now change your perception of the situation? What message might the stalker be trying to send? There are two other scenarios in here, but we're not going to go through all of them for the sake of time. So um, context is very important. Context is what makes the situation stalking or not stalking, and it can certainly make it scary. Let's watch another quick video. Context is critical in stalking cases. It's really everything in stalking cases because a lot of times what seems the scariest to a victim or survivor may seem benign or even nice to an outsider. For example, let's say a victim returns to her desk at work and finds roses. She might become very scared, thinking, well, does the stalker know where I live? How did they find me? Maybe the stalker even said something like, I'll send you roses today, I kill you. Meanwhile, her coworkers are saying, oh, this is so wonderful, and have no idea why the victim's reacting the way that she is. So if you don't understand why a victim's so afraid, you can simply ask them, why was that scary to you? What message did that send to you? Can you tell me more about that? There are multiple studies that show that victim fear is an excellent predictor of victim danger. In other words, if the victim's afraid, there's probably a good reason. Not all victims of stalking express fear the same way. In fact, some may not express fear at all. Some victims may seem more annoyed, sad, angry, or have no apparent reaction whatsoever. Different people react to trauma differently, and that doesn't mean they're not experiencing fear and or emotional distress. So to summarize, something may be scary to a victim that doesn't seem scary to an outsider. Stalking behaviors often have specific meanings only understood between the victim and the offender. And even if a victim isn't outwardly expressing fear, there may still be fear and still may be stalking. Context is key to understanding stalking and getting the tools to know it, name it, and stop it. So what is stalking? Stalking is a pattern of behavior directed at a specific person that would cause a reasonable person to fear for the person's safety or the safety of others or suffer substantial emotional distress. What's happening is scary or distressing, not the first incident and targets the same person, it could be stalking. 
So here are some quotes from some stalking victims. He knows everything about me. I am so frightened. My entire life has been stolen from me. My privacy has been taken from me. I am humiliated daily. It is a living hell. I don't understand. I just want to be left alone and move on with my life. It is beyond a nightmare. I do not feel safe at all. Stalking targets one person. Other people may be targeted to get to the one person, but it is a primary victim in mind. Stalking is a pattern. It's not a single incident or a one-off. It is a course of conduct in most stalking laws. So how do we name it? Stalking behaviors. There could be surveillance. They could be watching you. They could be following you. They're gathering information. Um, their life invasion could be that uh, they are showing up in the victim's life. So if you go to parties or family gatherings or out to the movies, um, they may just show up randomly. Interference, they could be sabotaging, attacking, or otherwise changing your the victim's life. They could be intimidating or scaring the victim. So following in or checking in on someone, whether it's in foot on foot or in a car or online, is stalking. Could be watching, waiting for places that the victim might go planting or accessing a, a camera or GPS or other recording device, putting a cup of coffee in somebody's car, <laughs> keeping track of the person's online and social media, hacking into accounts if they have your password, asking friends, families, and colleagues about the person. Uh, life invasion examples could be messaging, texting, emailing. Um, calling your phone and then hangs up, contacting other people close to the victim, showing up in public workplaces or gyms, joining groups or communities that the victim is a part of, leaving packages, notes for the victim, or spreading rumors or misinformation. Interference through sabotage or attack could be Hacking, tampering with accounts, impersonating the victim online, forced confrontations like standing in a hallway, not letting you by, damaging property, sabotaging through spreading rumors, causing trauma and or physical injury, or custody interference. Intimidation examples. Could be verbal or written online threats or embarrassing things that have happened. Direct or explicit threats, I will hurt you. Imp direct or implicit threats, remember when you told me about that secret and then spreading it online. Sending third parties to watch or intimidate you. Symbolic violence like scary gestures, property damage like slash tires blackmail or threats to release intimate or private photos or messages or information about you, threats to hurt themselves or one of your loved ones or pets, uh, forced confrontations, again, like standing in a hallway. So how often does this occur? Well, it happens. Uh, more than one in six women are, have been stalked. More than one in 17 men have been stalked or experienced some kind of stalking in their lifetime. Stalking dynamics. Women are more likely than men to experience stalking. I think we probably all know that. Um, but the majority of victims report that the offender is male regardless of the victim's sexual orientation. Less than 40% of stalking victims actually report this to law enforcement. And to me, that is huge. I am not sure exactly why people are not reporting it. Uh, I'm not sure if 
they're being threatened that if they report it, that the stalker is going to do something worse to them or to somebody in their family. Um, I have spoken to some college women who have been attacked on college campuses, and they basically told me that their law enforcement weren't, weren't going to do much about it, so they didn't even bother. And I just thought that that was terrible. You, if you report it, somebody should do something, at least document it if they don't do anything else. So these are some images of what um, could look like people that are either being stalked or the stalker themselves. Um, you can certainly see the bottom row, second photo in, and the first one for that matter. There's a woman with a man standing behind them. Um, I, and I wonder sometimes how many times do we pay attention to who's behind us when we're walking just down the street or going to the movies or out to a restaurant with our friends. Like, do we really know who's behind us? Do you really pay attention to those footsteps that you hear? <clears throat> so who are stalkers? The vast majority of stalking cases, the victim knows the predator. The victim and offender relationships. But the, most of the time it is either a current or former intimate partner. Um, if it's not an intimate partner, it could be an acquaintance. Um, you can see the stranger percentages are much lower, 17% versus um, the 62% or the 43% for males and females. Sometimes it is a family member. Um, and then very low percentages are persons of authority. So intimate partner stalkers, on average, in, intimate partner stalkers pose the greatest threats to their victims. And why do you think that is? I think it's because they know you. They know you very well. And they know secrets about you that nobody else does, right? So they know what time of day you come home. They know where you keep a spare key outside your door. They might have pictures of you that you all have shared um you know yeah in intimate settings um they know a lot more about you than anybody else does we're going to talk about this lady in a little bit so we're going to skip this for now um all right so part three how do we stop the stalking well we can't actually stop it but um we can do some things we can not normalize it you know i'm totally on facebook stalking you and i saw your new photos don't communicate with the people right just i'm i'm not being stalked currently so i can't say what i would do right now but i wouldn't respond to them i wouldn't say anything to them don't give them any kind of um clue that you're interested in them so we're going to name we're going to know what it is already we've named it because it's a repeat habit it's not a one off thing and now we're going to try to figure out how we can stop it most victims of stalking talk to a friend family member or someone else they know and trust first before deciding to seek additional help that person's response can make a huge difference. If the victim's fears are validated and taken seriously, they're more likely to tell others, as well as to seek additional help from law enforcement, victim service providers, or other community resources. If someone tells you that they're experiencing stalking, believe them. Many victims blame themselves so remind them that the stalking is not their fault. Nothing that the victim did or did not do justifies the stalker's behavior. If you see or hear from the stalker, do not share any information about the victim, no matter what the stalker says. 
Don't just have one conversation. Check in with your friend using the communication medium that they prefer. Encourage the victim to make a safety plan and to seek local services to help them do so. If you aren't sure where to start, Victim Connect can help make a referral to local resources. Stalking victims can also complete an assessment at coercivecontrol.org to learn more about the risks in their stalking case. And the Stalking Prevention Awareness and Resource Center has some general information about stalking at stalkingawareness.org. Remember, victims are the experts on their own lives and safety. Friends like you can provide the information, options, and support to help them make the right decisions for themselves. Together, we can know it, name it, and stop it. Most victims of stalking talk to a friend, family member, or someone else they know and trust first before. All right, so this um, slide here is a picture of um, a behavior log, and I'll put a link to this um, at the end of the video. But if you're not sure that someone is doing something repeatable, like um, parking in your neighborhood, or you know you think this car is following you from work, or they keep showing up at the same restaurant that you like to go to, or they're sending you text messages, or they're making lots of comments on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, um, at least start documenting it. The police have told me that if you don't document it, it's very hard to prove a pattern. So even if it turns out not to be anything big deal, at least start documenting what you've noticed. And if you decide you need to call the police at some point, you'll have some documentation to back up your story. So here are some brochures you can get from the stalkingawareness.org organization about stalking. It comes in English and Spanish. Um, and so we've talked about this already. So what will you do to address stalking? You're watching this video, so that's what you're doing. Um, so I want to stop this presentation, and then we're going to talk about a couple of things. All right, so I know that was quick. I don't want to, you know, make this too long so that um, it doesn't belabor the point, but we will be um, doing some things um, in person about stalking awareness so that you can um, get a little bit more information. But what I did want to do is I want to read to you the story um, that they use this lady's example of how she was stalked and why um, this was such a big deal for her. So um, this lady's name is Peggy and it says it began in the fall of 98. She was 28 years old. She was preparing for medical school uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She started dating a man named Patrick. She brought him home to meet her family. Um, it says he was a little bit too nice to all of us, a little too overbearing. Uh, when he brought a gun to the beach on a family vacation, they all warned Peggy to be careful. After that, the family only saw him a few more times. They were together for three years. Um, in March of 20, or 2002, Peggy decided to cut all ties with this man, Patrick. And the day that she left him, he began, began stalking her. He followed her everywhere that she went. He called her cell phone constantly. He waited for her outside her work and her gym and finally used his young daughter as a way to get Peggy to return his phone calls. When Peggy did not respond to any of this, he posted a flyer about Peggy with a picture of her and a cell phone number all around the city of Albuquerque. Um, that June, the family gathered in Florida for a wedding. Uh, Peggy, Peggy brought a new man she had been began dating named Mark. Um, Patrick, the old boyfriend, left uh, a message saying how sorry he was that he could not attend the family wedding. Uh, Patrick then flew to Ohio and spray painted, Peggy is a bad word, on their mother's garage. Then he returned to Albuquerque where he set fire to the new boyfriend's house. 
This guy is crazy. Um, the ex-boyfriend's behavior escalated. Can you believe it? Peggy comes home, and of course, now she's terrified. She went to the police and filed a stalking report and got a restraining order, which you should do. She began keeping a record of everything Patrick did from then on, and that is exactly what we were just showing you a minute ago. Um, Peggy asked the police, what will it take for you to do something about this? Um, they didn't answer her. She left um, for California to start a new life. She did everything she could to leave no trace or trail and to protect herself. She notified local authorities what had been happening. She used an unlisted address and an unlisted number, got a new cell phone. She told everyone that she worked with and all of her neighbors about him, showed him them a picture of him and urged them to call the police if they saw him in the area. Uh, during that time, they were all very careful to spend very little time talking to Peggy so that the other family members would not become victims as well. Um, she installed a security system. Um, let's see what else. Six days before the stalking trial was to happen, the ex-boyfriend found Peggy after months of searching. So she had moved and he still found her. He had hired a private investigator, which is not illegal. Flew to California, found her house. He posed as a private investigator and showed a delivery man a picture of Peggy. The delivery man told him, the ex-boyfriend, which house she lived in. When he caught up with her um, outside of her house one early Saturday morning, he duct taped her hands together. He choked her and he beat her. He beat her so severely with his gun that her blonde hair turned a different color. Despite all of this, Peggy managed to break free and flee to a neighbor's apartment where she was able to call 911. He followed her, broke through the sliding glass door, smashed through the door in the bedroom where she was hiding. With the police now surrounding the building, he held Peggy to the floor at gunpoint. Peggy said she knew at this point this was going to be the end. She called to the police officers outside the bedroom to get messages to her family. The ex-boyfriend did not care what was happening with the police. He shot Peggy and he shot himself. Peggy's sister says, to honor my sister's last request and a tribute to her memory, the daughter that I am now carrying will be named after her. We can never have Peggy back, but maybe this testimony can help keep other families from going through what my family has gone through. No one should have to experience the pain of losing a loved one the way we lost Peggy. So you can see, some stalkers will do anything, anything to get to their victims, including hurting themselves. So that's why this is so important for us all, men and women, to at least document what's happening. If you don't go to the police, at least document it. I personally would go to the police and at least report it so they can start seeing a pattern if it becomes a pattern. I would put out a restraining order. I would do whatever the police tell you to do um, to try to at least document this because if this person is doing it to you, they might be doing it to somebody else too, right? So it's a very touchy subject. And like I said, I'm not an attorney and I'm not with the police, I can't give you all of the details that they would, but I would just hope and pray that if something like this is happening, that you do report it and at least um, the police can start, you know, watching your neighborhood. They can watch your house. When you go on vacation, at least where I live, I can put in a vacation notice to my police department. They will come by and check my house. 
they'll check the property, see if you know anything looks out of the ordinary. You can certainly when you go on vacation, have your mail held at the post office so it doesn't look like you're gone for a long amount of time. Um, I personally love security cameras. You can see who's coming on your property. I have more than one. So you might want one at the front door or the back door. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can do probably that you haven't thought of. And I will be making a checklist of those things and I'll put those out for you um, to use as well. So I hope these signs were helpful to you. I know this was quick. I just wanted to kind of just give you some food for thought. Um, and we will go into this more into detail in person when we meet. So watch my website at Forward Safety Training over there um, to find out when we're holding the next class. And um, hope to see you soon in another class that I have. Take care. Stay safe.